small group. Since it's a small group, I want to keep it as interactive as possible. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to stop me and, you know, we can talk about it. Um, I don't want to just go on a lecture by myself. <laughs> so feel free to jump in when you when you have questions or any comments as well. I'm sure some of you have a lot more experience than I do. All right. So let's start with the, the topic for today was, can you guys all hear me okay, first of all? Yes, we can. Hey, can you hear me okay? Is it clear enough? Yes, we can hear you. So you're a little, sometimes your internet connection is a little bit now, but we can hear you. Sorry, sorry. I think Elizabeth, you were breaking up. I couldn't hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So is it is it okay now? Can you guys all hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so today we're going to be talking about asthma diagnosis and management. And this is a very common topic that you know most of us would come across. So feel free to chime in at any point in time if you have any questions or comments, okay? All right, so what, let's start with what is asthma because even though most of us know asthma or we think we know asthma, that is really no great way to 100% diagnose this disease, okay? So it is a heterogeneous disease, so that's not a one cookie cut uh, shape for asthma, that it comes in many shapes and sizes. And it's usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation Information. So it's usually defined as history of respiratory symptoms such as wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough. And the other key feature is that it's variable. It, it varies over time, intensity, and um, uh, airflow limitation. That's another key feature of asthma. So asthma phenotypes, like I said, it's not all the same. Asthma can come in many different forms. It can come in allergic asthma, which a lot of times happens from early childhood, family history, and response to the ICS. Some patients have non-allergic asthma. Typically, um, typically they are found to have less eosinophilic component uh, um, and less respond to ICS. So they may not respond as well to the inhalers that we put them on. There are patients who have adult onset asthma, typically women in adult life, and they 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 usually require higher doses of ICS, and sometimes it can be refractory to corticosteroids. That's why there are some patients in their 40s and 50s who come and they start having new onset asthma symptoms. Asthma with persistent airflow limitations. So in some patients who have had asthma for a long time, especially if they go without being treated, this can cause chronic remodeling of the airway and cause fixed airflow obstruction. So it can present with persistent airflow limitation. And asthma with obesity is another problem, um, very commonly in, in uh, West Virginia, and prominent respiratory symptoms with little eosinophilia. So always just think about you know, obesity and asthma because they definitely have a, have a play together. All right, so let's talk about asthma prevalence. This is the most up-to-date data I could find from CDC. So in West Virginia, it's about 10% of our population who has asthma that um, is defined by the clinical symptoms, which is still one in 10 patients who have asthma. Definitely, definitely uh, counties and countries that have more occupational exposures, that have more environmental exposures, more pollen, more green, have more risk of having asthma, as you guys can see in the different uh, color codes that, that is shown. So diagnosis of asthma. So I'm going to break up my talk into diagnosis of asthma, assessing asthma, as well as management of asthma, because there are definitely three components to, to this. So let's talk about the diagnosis of asthma first. Number one, history. All right, as mentioned, you need to have variable airflow limitation, which means that symptoms vary over time. And that's a hallmark feature of asthma. The other thing that you should be able to do is be able to diagnose that they truly have asthma before you start them on a, on a, a controller treatment. Understandably, some patients would have already been started and then it would be difficult to diagnose them, but always make it a habit if you could to diagnose uh, before starting them on treatment so we can adequately know if this is truly asthma. 
Asthma is usually characterized by airway inflammation and hyper-responsiveness, but these are not necessary or sufficient to make the diagnosis of asthma. So it's kind of an elusive diagnosis to make. So in some patients, if you're not too sure what is asthma and what is not, there are increased probability that some patient has more asthma symptoms than not. They have an increased probability if they have more than one type of symptoms, such as wheeze and shortness of breath, cough, chest tightness. Typically, these patients respond, uh, mention that their symptoms are worse at night or early in the morning. So if you have somebody who says, hey, my cough is only when I lie down at nighttime, right when I'm getting to bed. That doesn't sound like typical asthma, but if somebody says, hey, I start coughing more in the morning, that's more suggestive of asthma. Like I mentioned, symptoms vary over time. It's not fixed. It's not every day that they have these symptoms. Um, symptoms are triggered by viral infection. Post-COVID, we have had a lot of patients who have increased asthma prevalence. Um, exercise, allergen exposure, uh, exposure changes in um, uh, weather, irritants, smoke, strong smells. So if you have a clear trigger, that's also more likely that somebody has asthma. So decreased probability that patient symptoms are due to asthma if you have only a cough without other symptoms, chronic production of sputum, which can happen in COPD, which can happen in bronchiectasis, um, shortness of breath associated with dizziness, lightheadedness, and peripheral tingling. All of those suggest that they, hey, there might be more other causes of it, such as you know, pulmonary hypertension or more cardiac etiologies. Chest pain is not very typical for, for just primary asthma. Chest tightness with other associated symptoms is. Exercise-induced dyspnea with noisy inspiration, such as triator. That's not very typical for asthma. Asthma can come in with patients with vocal cord dysfunction. However, for it to be very specific, it's kind of unlikely. So diagnosis, sorry. So for, for the diagnosis of asthma, like I had mentioned, the, the keyword is variable airflow limitation, okay? So most of these patients who have asthma, for the majority of the times, they do not have a reduction in FEV1, FVC ratio. Majority of them don't, unless they have a fixed obstruction with chronic long-standing asthma. However, you will note at times that, you know, the FE, their, their ratios can vary and at different times, the FE1 could be low. Um, most of the times, most of the times, there are other things that I often use to see whether somebody has more probability of asthma, such as excessive bronchodilator reversibility. For example, if you look at the um, flow volume loops and you see an increase in your um, FEV1 and your uh, um, MLs increase after using an inhaler, that's more suggestive of variation in lung function. Granted, you can see this in COPD as too, but it's a clinical context that we need to put it in. If you have a methacholine challenge and you have a reduction in FEV1 by, by about 20%, that's also suggestive of some variation in function. And another one, a key one that's easy to ask is for them to do the peak flow meter, um, you know, for them to take it home to kind of measure at different times um, to see if there's a variability. And that will be another one that would help you figure out if this is truly asthma that we are talking about. And if patients have an increase in the FE1 or their peak flow um, uh, measurings after about four weeks of controller treatment, that also suggests, hey, you could have some variable um, airflow limitations. So let's look at the, at the uh, curves and flow volume loops for asthma. So in normal cases, it's the green. As you guys can, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with this diagram. Asthma itself causes a reduction in your FEV1 just because of the airway obstruction, okay? So characteristically, the loop for the flow volume loops, it, the, the size of it doesn't narrow. It's not a restrictive disease, but it's these, it, this, this, um, it's scooping out of the, of the, um, of the graph that we see, as you can see in, in the blue as well as the red diagrams. The inspiratory loop is the same. It should be preserved and the volume should be preserved as well. So other adjuncts that you can use for um, diagnosing asthma is allergy testing. A lot of times we use the uh, West Virginia allergy panel to identify if they have allergy component to that. And that also could 
be more suggestive so that somebody has more of an allergic asthma versus a non-allergic asthma. Another thing that can be used is what we call phenol, fractional um, concentration of exhaled nitric oxide. This is a little test that you can do to kind of see how much uh, TH2 inflammation they have in the airway. Granted, this is not a foolproof way. All it does is an adjunct to help you see if there is TH2 inflammation, and that's about it. This is not standard of care yet. All right, when it comes to asthma, I think it's important to make sure we rule out other things that um, would be differential diagnoses for asthma, such as uh, chronic upper airway cough syndrome. Very, very common, especially if you have post-nasal drip. Um, or acid reflux that could be causing this chronic upper airway cough syndrome, uh, laryngeal obstructions, hyperventilations, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, cardiac failure. Medication-related cough should never be forgotten about because medications like lisinopril um, or ACE inhibitors can definitely aggravate cough. So that should be the first thing to go should you see cough. Um, pulmonary embolism, tuberculosis, although less likely in this, in this area right now. All right, so like I was uh, mentioning, the diagnosis of asthma in other contexts, the common ones you would see would be upper airway cough syndrome, like I had mentioned. Cough variant asthma is a kind of asthma that is predominantly just presenting with cough. So just put it in context, because majority of the times, if you elicit for more history, they do have some other symptoms as well. Occupational asthma is asthma that is worse when you're at work and better when you are away from work, okay? There are some patients who have underlying asthma that is work exacerbated. So this is not necessarily uh, asthma that is started at work, but is exacerbated by their workplace. And there's this is a concept called asthma COPD overlap, which is some people believe in it, some people don't. This was actually uh, previously in the 2020 guidelines, and this was taken off in the 2022 GINA guidelines. And there is still a phenotype that can kind of go between both. In the gist of it, the way I would talk about it is if, if it sounds more like asthma, what I mean by that, there's variability in symptoms, there's uh, improvement with ICS, there's specific triggers. If you have an allergic component, you treat it as asthma. On the other side, if you have a patient who has persistent, persistent dyspnea, significant smoking exposure, um, significant limitation in physical activity, and kind of consistent symptoms, it's more important to treat them as COPD. And, and the primary key differences in those two is in asthma, you initially start the patient, the first line is ICS inhaled corticosteroids. The first line in COPD is LAMA, masquerading agonist and not ICS, because if you were to start ICS as a first line in COPD is, they're more likely to have pneumonias, okay? So there, are, there is a subgroup that is asthma plus COPD uh, combination. These patients have variable uh, functioning, or, but also have underlying exposures significant exposures to smoking or other um, environmental agents that will put them at higher risk of developing COPD. In this group of patients, ICS is still the first line. So if you suspect asthma, COPD group, please think of ICS first, okay? But if you think of primarily COPD as a predominant pathology, think of LAMA first. All right, so let's talk about uh, assessment of asthma. So how do you, number one, assess asthma? So majority of the times we go by mild, moderate, uh, severe, persistent asthma. Most of this definition is based on what medications they are on. They are not static and may change over months to year. For example, if I have a patient on just ICS uh, LABA or PRN um, ICS and SABA, you can define them as mild asthma. If you have a patient on uh, well control on step three, which I'll go to the diagram in a moment, or low or medium dose ICS lava, then those patients can be moderate persistent asthma. If you have a patient on more therapies, high dose ICS lava, LAMA, and other um, adjuncts that you could use, then you would define it as severe asthma. So in, in summary, you define the severity by what the medications they are on at that point in time. Okay, um, it is very important dis to distinguish control asthma versus severe asthma, and I'll come to that in a moment. 
So when you talk about asthma, number one, you have to identify the severity. Number two, you have to assess the um, you have to assess the um, control of asthma. Okay, what does that mean? So how well have their symptoms been controlled in the last four weeks? Do they have risk factors for poor outcomes, including poor lung function? Okay, so things that you should always check for every patient with asthma is inhaler technique and adherence. Ask about side effects. Do patients have a written asthma action plan? What are the patient's attitudes and goals for their asthma? And also think of comorbidities such as acid reflux, obesity, OSA, depression. All of this contribute to how well the asthma might be controlled. All right. This is an example of the GINA assessment of the asthma control. It's a simple form um, that you could get the patients to fill up to kind of assess if it's well controlled, partly controlled, uncontrolled. One of the things that I like to use, I like to print out the uh, asthma control test, um, which, which grades out of 25. Anything less than 20 is not, is, it's not partly controlled or not well controlled. So that gives you some room to work with. It is always important to assess risk factors for, for poor asthma outcomes um, because they had a higher risk of exacerbation for them to have chronic um, airflow limitation and to have more side effects. There are some independent risk factors for exacerbations um, ever intubated. If they have, have ever been intubated, they definitely have a higher risk of having uh, difficult to control asthma. If they have had more than one exacerbation in the last 12 months, most of the times the patients I see have had three to four, even six exacerbations in the last one month, uh, one year. If they have a low FEV1, like I mentioned, if you already have obstructive changes on your PFD, that is not a great start because you already have fixed changes uh, because of um, chronic airway remodeling. If they are not using that technique appropriately or not knowing how to use the inhalers, if they have poor adherence due to medication costs or getting them inhalers, if they are, if they are smokers, they have a higher increased risk of having exacerbations. If you have elevated pheno, like I have mentioned in allergic asthma, obesity, pregnancy, and blood eosinophilia, all of these are risk factors for exacerbations. Just to give it in context, in pregnancy specifically, one third of patients uh, in pregnancy actually have better asthma control, one third have about the same, and one third get worse. So just keep an eye out for which way the patient is going. So when you talk about asthma, severity and control for every patient, the way you should do it is number one, great the severity. So like I was mentioning, the severity is based on what medications the patient is currently on. So for example, moderate persistent asthma with good asthma control, but because she's had, um, she's had exacerbations previously, She's at increased risk of um, future exacerbations, okay? Or a patient with severe persistent asthma with poor asthma control and has several risk factors for exacerbation, including um, reduced FEV1, current smoker, poor medication adherence. This would help you identify which are the patients that are more likely to feel what you're trying to do. And these are also the patients that you can refer appropriately if you think they're at a higher risk of uh, failing the current therapies. One of the things that I, I think is often forget about, forgotten about is 80% of patients actually don't know how to use their inhalers appropriately. And there needs to be a lot of education on how to use their inhalers because if you're not using your inhalers appropriately, you can only expect medication delivery to be inadequate. Um, and just keep that in mind. So I think assessing it at every visit and most of the times I tell the patients to bring their inhalers so I can review it with them. So always make sure that whenever they do put the um, medication to their mouth, it needs to be a nice seal, okay? And they do need to time it as to when they, when they suck in and hold, and they have to hold for a couple of seconds. If they're not able to do that, if they're not able to coordinate, something like a spacer for different kinds of inhalers might help. Especially in kids, we do more of our spaces as well. Um, this is, this is um, a copy of the uh, action plan that you can provide to your patients, especially for those that you think are higher risk of exacerbating on when to call your doctor. 
Um, as an asthmatic myself, I can tell you that most of the times asthmatics underplay our symptoms because we live with it and we don't realize something is off until you put the pieces together. So kind of having a written plan that they could paste on their refrigerator, put it up anywhere that's convenient for them so that they understand when they should intervene before it's too late. So this is a category that oftentimes we get referred, uncontrolled asthma versus severe asthma. This is two distinct phenomena. Okay, uncontrolled asthma is actually more common than severe asthma, and uncontrolled asthma is still treatable. All right, majority of the times is due to poor um, inhaler technique, it's due to medication, uh, poor medication adherence, or even incorrect diagnosis of asthma. Definitely for some patients who have acid reflux or um, rhinitis. obesity, not addressing those can definitely cause your asthma to be uncontrolled too. Or some patients have ongoing exposures to their pet dander or irritants at home or environmental agents that they cannot control. They're more likely to have uncontrolled asthma. They may not have severe asthma. It's more likely to be uncontrolled asthma. All right, so let's move on and talk about asthma control, uh, management. So the key, there are some goals that for every patient with asthma that you want to achieve, you want to achieve good symptom control. The severity of asthma doesn't change. However, you want to have good symptom control when they do come to you, no matter what the inhaler regimen you've put, put them on. You want to minimize asthma-related uh, mortality. You want to minimize exacerbations. You want to make sure they don't develop persistent airflow limitations. And there are side effects to this medication, too, which you def definitely do need to ask. Common ones would be thrush. Some of them do have palpitations. Some of them have more restlessness, inability to fall asleep. These and uh, with patients who are on medications like Singular, they can have nightmares. These are all things that you definitely want to look into when you talk to them about asthma management. Because if if what you're doing is not helping the patient, they're more likely to discontinue the treatment. So when it comes to asthma, there are three main components: you assess, you adjust, and you re a review. So number one. Definitely, you want to uh, confirm the diagnosis. You want to modify the uh, modifiable risk factors, inhaler techniques, patient preferences, and goals. Um, you want to treat the modifiable risk factors, such as sleep apnea, if they have underlying um, uh, heart failure, uh, fluid status. You definitely want to optimize as many things as you can. And then you want to reduce the number of exacerbations, patient satisfaction, improve patient satisfactions, and improve the lung functioning. So this is the GINA 2022 guideline. In, in summary, um, even back in 2020, there was a huge shift from using SABA, which is short acting uh, bronchodilators only, to using ICS LABA as needed, or using ICS with SABA. All right, let me just repeat that so there's no confusion, okay? So there has been a shift towards not using SABA anymore in isolation, and I'll come to that, but focusing more on ICS LABA as, as, um, to be used as needed, or ICS with SABA to be used as needed, okay? So um, I'm just gonna focus on a couple more things. Like I had mentioned earlier, your severity um, of the asthma is depending on what step, which is basically what medication of inhaler that you're on. So for, for a patient who has mild persistent asthma, starting them on something like low-dose ICS LABA to be used as needed is appropriate, or starting them on something like um, ICS, such as Flovent, to be used with, used with short acting is also appropriate. As the severity increases, just remember that even among the ICS uh, LABAs, you still have medications that are mild, moderate, and high-dose ICS LABAs. So there's still a variety you could play with. So for patients who have moderate asthma, just make sure they are at least on mild, uh, low dose, low to medium doses of uh, ICS LABA. As you go higher up, the intensity of the ICS uh, LABA increases. And it's step five is typically when you talk about severe asthma, when you talk about LAMA being added on. Okay, you don't add lava on until they are having severe persistent asthma. All right, and I'll come to the adjuncts in a little bit. So, like I was mentioning, um, huge trend to move away from Saba. So, the 
studies have now shown that the use of Saba, even for one to two weeks, is actually associated with increased risk of exacerbations, increased allergic response, and increased yeast nodules. In the past, Saba was thought to be the first line um, because asthma was thought to be a disease of bronchial constriction. And Saba is a fairly cheap and easy to find, which is why it was um, used pretty extensively. However, now data shows that use of Saba is associated with excess patients and increased mortality. And starting a patient on just Saba, such as Albutrol, Zopanex, most majority of the patients just regard it as a primary asthma treatment, which is no longer adequate. Um, and using the ICS as the only medication um, is, is less likely to make them adherent to the other medications that you know they might need. All right, so there have been a lot of more studies that have come into place as needed low dose ICS lava, as compared with as needed SABA, reduce risk of severe exacerbations by 60 to 64%. And when you compare as needed ICS lava with maintenance low dose ICS, the outcomes were actually pretty similar. Your risk of severe exacerbations was pretty similar. So it was now made standard that you could use ICS lava as a PRN or an alternative with low dose maintenance ICS. There's also evidence uh, with um, meta analysis that show that in patients, there is a 55% reduction in severe exacerbations as compared with Saba alone. And there's a similar risk of exacerbation with daily ICS plus as needed Saba. So either one of those two. There is a definite reduction in your ED visits or hospitalizations, 65% lower than the Saba alone, and 37% lower than with daily ICS. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, Lama should not be used as monotherapy for asthma uh, without ICS because they had an increased risk of severe exacerbations. The way I remember this, if you are thinking this is primarily asthma, the mainstay should be ICS. Um, it could be mild, moderate, high doses of ICS, but Lama is an adjunct in severe asthma and should not be the primary uh, first line therapy. Lama is beneficial when you add it as an adjunct when you're talking about severe asthma, but it really doesn't improve uh, clinical benefits majority of times for the patients, okay? As mentioned, uh, patients with exacerbation should receive at least medium dose ICS lava before considering Lama. There are some medic adjunct medications that you would use in asthma that were previously used such as um, sodium chromoglycate. Some patients still use theophylline. There really isn't much data on this on the newer guidelines anymore. Um, so please kindly use that with consideration. Um, so for difficult to treat, uncontrolled and severe asthma. So what do we do with these patients? Number one, make sure you have already managed all their other comorbidities that would lead them to having poor asthma control as well as inhaler technique. And once they have been defined to have severe asthma, please consider adding on um, you know, medications such as biologics, all right? You can consider biologics based on uh, whether they have more of an eosinophilic predominant in the, in, the, uh, in the blood, whether it's phenol-driven, whether it's um, IgE-driven, so for there are there are several classes of, of biologics and they work slightly different targeting different things. But the gist of it, you have anti-IgE, anti which is mostly for severe allergic asthma. And most of these patients usually have a IgE as, uh, in their bloodstream as well as a peripheral eosinophilia. And then you have anti-IL-5s and anti-IL-5Rs that are again still dependent on the blood eosinophilia levels, okay? And you do have anti-IL-4, which is again dependent on some blood eosinophilia levels. So you need to have some kind of defining modalities to put them on, on the biologics. Once you put them on biologics, you have to trial them on it for at least four months to assess their response. Granted, hopefully they don't have an allergic reaction that would make them stop this um, biologic, but 
that would be an adequate trial to see if something has helped, okay? If you're not too sure, extend it and see if that has resulted in a better outcome. And for some patients who you might start them on a biologic, but it might not be giving them the response that they want. After the adequate trial, you can consider switching around their biologics. There have been no studies that have compared them head to head to say which is better for which patient. So it's, it's mostly a trial and error at this time. Um, as I was saying, so there's, there are some key changes with uh, the 2022 guidelines. Um, IL-4 dupilumab for severe eosinophilic type 2 asthma is also now approved for um, children with um, eosinophilic type or type 2 asthma not on um, maintenance OCS. I'm, I do not deal with children. I don't think this would be very applicable to me, but this might be something you can think of if you do have uh, more children in your panel as well. And this is another medication called tepilizumab or Tespire, and this is now uh, approved for severe asthma. This is a medication that does not require for you to have eosinophilia, pheno, or IgE. So for in patients who do not meet the other criteria for the other biologics, Tepilizumab might be an option. All right, this is a table of um, some of the multiple different um, biologics that we do have. Omalizumab is your typical IgE, mepalizumab, benrilizumab, dupolizumab, and um, tazapulumab. These are all common medications that we use. And like I mentioned, except for tepalumab, which is the only one that doesn't meet any of the diagnostic criteria to qualify it. Um, for patients who have for patients who have asthma, you definitely want to think about a couple other things that you should be doing with them. Number one, always talk about uh, allergen immunotherapy, especially if they have a positive uh, allergy panel or significant allergy to different identifiable factors. Um, allergen therapy can definitely help in those cases. Vaccinations is, is key, considering a lot of these patients are more prone to getting um, viral infections, bacterial infections, and having mortality as a result. Bronchial thermoplasty is a newer, um, slightly newer modality that is up and coming. From what I can gather, one third of the patients who undergo uh, bronchial thermoplasty in severe persistent asthma would have improvement. One third will have about the same um, kind of uh, symptoms and one third would actually be worse because the uh, bronchial thermoplasty makes the inflammation worse. Smoking cessation is key, physical activity, weight reduction, stress management, physical rehabilitation. These are all keys in helping uh, manage uh, asthma adequately. I was able to find this video just to kind of illustrate the importance of identifying asthma because asthma in itself can kill. Um, I'm just gonna sh uh, show this video real quick, okay? So, sick, sick, Can anybody understand that, or should we just stop the video because that's not going anywhere? Yeah, it's really hard to hear that, Amira, and I, okay. I think we apologize. Sometimes it is harder to hear that through there, but with the video, we, everyone will have that video, you know, to watch on okay. their own part of that school. Okay, that's, that's completely fine. Um, so I'll just move over. So in the gist of it, what the video was trying to summarize was that asthma can present very insidiously. But majority of the times, if you ask them for their symptoms, they've had the symptoms for a while, 
Okay, so eliciting those symptoms is very important because they can have a very severe um, exacerbation that can cause them to die and mortality is not insignificant. A lot of times it also comes with younger people dying from uncontrolled asthma. So just keep that in mind that asthma is a deadly disease. Okay, um, let me just finish this. All right, so as I want to finish, um, I just wanted to kind of um, kind of show you guys different kinds of inhalers that are often talked about. I, I do think there's a lot of confusion about which inhalers to choose. The, the main big classes you're talking about is short acting beta agonist, long acting beta agonist, we don't use in isolation. Okay, you talk about inhaled corticosteroids, you talk about combination medications that is ICS and LABA. You talk about medications that is LABA and LAMA, which is more of a COPD spectrum, and primarily LAMA. Okay, um, I think if any of you guys are prescribing asthma medications or COPD medications, it's good to have these um, charts up in your office for easy reference, because even for myself, I always have to refer to what is number one covered for the different patients as well as what are the different uh, things I could try. Um, when it comes to inhalers, again, there is three different types of inhalers just to kind of um, summarize. There's a metered, metered dose inhalers, okay, which is like your albutrol that is commonly used like your Symbicot. These are easier to use with your um, spacer. You have your dry powder inhaler. Most of the times this is similar to um, Advir Discus, uh, as well as Brio's, um, Incruise, the different kind of modalities that you might see. And you, you might see uh, soft mist inhalers, such as Spiriva Respimat or uh, Stialto. Is one better than the other? No. However, it depends on how the patient responds to each. There are some patients of mine who do not prefer this dry powder. So if that's the response when they kind of take sucking it in and if they can't adequately get the medication delivery, I'll try switching it over to something like a soft mist or an MBI with a spacer to see if that is a better response. Um, but that's usually how I play around with inhalers to see what I can get my patients um, to be most comfortable with. Um, with that, I end my presentation. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? Or any comments? Oops. Quick question. Sure. Um, so you've talked a lot about symptoms as far as essential in the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to, if I gave you just spirometry, Mm -hmm. And let's and I'll let and even with bronchodilator, can mm -hmm. you make an asthma diagnosis off of that as no. A, with no with no other information, as opposed to telling it apart from COPD or no. any other of any other vaguely no. you know obstructive lung disease? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. So the answer to that, yeah, the answer to that is no. So even in patients who have COPD, some of them do have bronchodilator response. And in COPD, the bronchodilator response is actually a, tends a poorer outcome. So it's only in the right context. So I cannot just go by spirometry, whether a patient has asthma. Okay, thank you very much. My second question, because I'm less familiar with the asthma treatment guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, I know the gold, the gold guidelines for COPD have a huge problem of too much in industry influence and in making only using expensive medicines. Yeah. The medic, the refer, the asthma guidelines you were talking about earlier, do they have the same problem um, as far as trying to get people on more expensive medicines rather than you know just occasional inexpensive medicines? I I so because the ICS and LABAS come in many different varieties and. Most of the times insurance covers different things and they're generic options. I'm gonna say no, but I don't know enough about what is triggered uh, behind those uh, guidelines. But basically the, the gist of the changes is because Saba shouldn't be used in isolation anymore. Um, if you can find something that's more affordable for the patient, absolutely. But I don't think there's one medication that is 
preferred in relation to other when it comes to the ICS um, LABA combinations or the ICS alone combinations. Dr. Amir, I, I would like to comment on Dr. Wernz's question because I had the same question in mind and and I would I haven't I haven't looked into this, but it would only take a few minutes to look into it. But until proven otherwise, my assumption is that the foundation of Gina is the same as the foundation of gold, which is its pharmaceutical industry sponsored and controlled. Mm -hmm. um, with boards of directors that usually uh, have international pulmonology experts who are on about six to 15 speaker panels a piece. So, um, so I put in the chat that there are other available guidelines besides Gina. Actually, one of the things I learned from your talk is, is about Gina, because I didn't even know Gina existed. That, and it tells me that the pharmaceutical industry jumped into the game in 2021, realizing, especially with the change in guidelines that you explained. Um, so um, at, at any rate, the other, and also they filled a gap because the U.S. National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute hasn't updated their guidelines since 2007. Those are the EP3 guidelines that we grew up with, that we grew up with in medicine. That's old guys. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also nice guidelines from UK, where unlike the GINA guidelines, every medicine there is affordable and available to every person in the population. With unfortunately, with the the really great um, overview you gave of management, many, many patients cannot afford and cannot get those medicines. So, um, but anyway, that's my sort of long guess of an answer to what Dr. Warren's asked. So, so Dan and, and, you know, and Carol, I'll jump in. There's really strong evidence in support of combined uh, inhaled steroid uh, and beta agonist treatment as the initial treatment. It, it's really, I mean, the, the, the literature on that is extremely strong and it's not a, uh, it's not an industry conspiracy. Uh, the, you know, the big issue with combined ICS LABA in the US uh, is, that, uh, is that what's recommended is a rapid acting LABA. Many of the LABAs are slow acting and they won't provide symptomatic relief right away. So the combined uh, steroid that's probably the the combined uh, uh, you know beta agonist steroid that 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 uh, that is probably the best are the combinations that include famotidol you know which which I don't believe is available in the U.S. yet you know so but combined saba and and uh, uh, you know and uh, and steroid you know is pretty mainstream treatment and you know and and then for really bad treat for you know, patients with really bad asthma, uh, the new biological modifiers like the monoclonal antibodies that Amira was talking about, they're great medications. You know, we've had so many terrible asthma patients over the years that, that you know, that steroids were the only thing that would work for them and they had terrible side effects from them, you know, that can be avoided with, with the new medications. You know, so you know, so I think what's what was presented really is mainstream, really is appropriate, really is supported by the literature, you know, and it's not some kind of conspiracy or something. You know, and Amira, you might want to comment on that. Yeah, so I granted, you know, some of you guys have been in this profession longer than I have been. Um, and I do think there's an evolution, but I don't think GINA guidelines 2022 is the only one that has been talking about this ICS LABA. 2020 was when it actually changed. And prior to that, uh, most of the times we have been going by GINA guidelines for uh, most of these medications. And I can, from my personal experience, attest that it does work appropriately, just up titrating the medications appropriately. Granted, I know get, uh, patients getting and affording the medications uh, with insurance coverage is not something that is easy to manage at this time. Um, and thank you for, for all your questions. There's a couple more questions on the chat. Let me just uh, read this out real quick. Um, so I think there's a question on, has for from Martin Eon, has your health system implemented as smart across the system? And how have you educated primary care? Can I clarify what is as smart? 
sorry, the smart therapy, it's using the um, symbol cord for um, PRN. So in, in our practice, we have not specifically just chosen Symbicot. Most of the times we see what the insurance covers and then we go for that appropriately, but not that I know about um, in, in this WVU system out here. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I can't attest to that at this point in time. Um, Saba ICS is FDA approved, but does not have insurance coverage yet. So let's hold on for advertising. So with relations to the inhaler medications, there, there are going to be plenty that will be coming out. There are going to be medications that are generic that are now being patented. I think that's, that's not a fight that I have control over, <laughs> um, unfortunately, and that's not something that is easy to fix. All I can advise is for patients that you have trouble uh, finding them on appropriate inhalers. Most of the times I reach out to social work. Most of the times I reach out, I play around with their combinations to see what is most affordable or generic. And that's usually what I try to do. Yeah, and thank you for the chat comment about Symbacort. So Symbacort is Fomoterol Budesonide. So that is appropriate for asthma. Mm -hmm. So can I just add, so I, I work in Portland, Maine. So Maine Health has a team of people and we have them scattered because we have nine hospitals scattered across the regions that we have them working with pharmaceutical uh, companies and every single pharmaceutical company has a program where they have reduced cost inhalers. So it, sometimes it's zero copay, sometimes it's $20 a month and so forth. So our investment in having these, these people working with them pays off at the end of the day because patients can then afford their meds. So just something to think about. Um, that, that is a great idea. I think at this time, from where I'm working, most of the times we try not to reach out to pharmaceutical companies because we don't want to have... Um, um, you know, uh, any kind of barrier between them and us. But, at the, but I can definitely bring it up to Dr. Sharma, see if that's something that he can help with in the other systems. Thank you. And thank you so much for those questions and presentation. I think there is the other, do we address the Saba IC? Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> FDA approved, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so yes. much. Are there any other comments or questions? All right. I really appreciate your time and everyone else's time today and contributing to this great conversation um, surrounding asthma. Our next time we're going to meet is going to be May 15th on air quality epidemiology. And we look forward to seeing everyone. Thank you very much. Um, um, Elizabeth, do they have access to my slides?